All right. So we are live. Uh, we are here. I, I don't know. I think we're going to try to start doing these once a month, uh, but where we we're, we bring in senior leaders and bounce around different ideas. But for everybody that is here, welcome. Uh, appreciate you guys tuning into the podcast live. Uh, and if you're listening to this on a recording, we appreciate you turn, tuning in. Uh, with us today, we've got some some of the most in innovative leaders in the industry. Uh, we've got Garrett Classy at Nebraska. We've got Drew Martin at Texas. And we've got Monica LeBron at Tennessee. I almost said Tulane, but I corrected myself before I said it. So um, welcome, guys. I I'm really excited to have all of you on the show with us today. We're going to hopefully share some new ideas with everybody and give everybody a peek behind the curtains into your brains and what you're thinking about. Um, so let's get it started. I'm going to just issue this out. I, let's feel free to keep this really conversational, talk over each other, bounce ideas off. Let's let's make it less like a stuffy panel like we've seen so often before and more like kind of friends talking about different ideas. Imagine you've got your feet up on a chair drinking bourbon somewhere in a cigar lounge. I don't know if that's a thing, but um, all right, here we go. So let's start with the first one. What have just been some of your bigger reflections as to where the college athletics industry is headed right now? Um, thinking about maybe what's changed in the last 12 months and how that kind of gives you a preview of what's to come in the next five years let's say two to five years, where you think the industry is going. I'm going to leave it really broad and we're going to get really specific after these, but feel, anybody feel free to chime in and answer that. I'll go ahead and start, I guess, since no one else wanted to take it. I mean, I don't know um, if Drew and Monica would agree with this, but I think it's, it's pretty well known that in college athletics, we're usually two to five to 10 years behind the trends in sports and we're very much a copycat business. And we don't, I don't think as an industry, we do enough to look at what other leagues are doing, not just in the United States, but across the world. I mean, there's some innovative stuff being done everywhere. And so I think that's the big challenge that I issue to our external staff daily is like, that's great that you're reading D1 ticker. That's great. You're on these NACTA webinars, but let's not just follow what other, other schools are doing. We need to do what, what's best for Nebraska, our fan base and really look at other technologies out there. And I, and I will say, you know, our, our fan base in general is, is aging and an older fan base. And, and I think the pandemic really gave us an opportunity to speed up some of the things that we want to do as far as mobile ticketing, um, more of a data warehouse type environment here. And so I think for us, this is the pandemic has been helpful to bring some new technologies to our fan base into our athletic department and a few things we're looking at I like everyone we're looking at nfts um how do you um you know uh, have some unique digital experiences and where you can set up your own marketplace for nfts we're also looking at something that's unique one of our former football players actually owns uh some outlet malls and he's got a unique concept to where he's got an ecosystem to where every person within his shopping mall um gets 15 percent back on each of their purchases and it's a membership fee to get in there. And we're looking at doing that um, within all of our corporate sponsorships and how do you create a membership model? And for, in turn for us, we are able to collect that data and it makes our sponsorships more valuable um, um, to our corporate partners. And so a lot of things are going on um, here in Nebraska, but those are a few of the things that we're looking at right now. You know, th those are some of the things, Garrett, I, I agree with you. We, we do tend to lag behind, particularly in tech in the collegiate space behind the, the professional leagues, but also expanding out and taking a look beyond that. And, you know, you, you mentioned NFTs, you mentioned, um, you know, what, what, what you all doing with the, the mall concept there. Um, I think taking a look at the broad, broad landscape of the consumer um, habits over the last 12 to 14 months. I mean, we've seen such a shift to digital and such an adoption of um, mobile ordering of, of walking into a restaurant and not interfacing with, with a, um, a wait staff member, but doing everything, you know, mobily through your phone. You know, we've certainly benefited from, from being able to shift to that um, mobile ticket environment, doing some of the mobile ordering with concessions in the stadium, but really just watching consumers over the last 14 months, and particularly as, as, as we've gotten vaccines rolled out and been able to travel a little bit, um, be able to see how, how people who are um, visiting are forming their own um, paths and, and what is sticking and what is starting to, to slide back into 
um, what used to be. It's, it's been really, really interesting to observe that and how are we going to capitalize. You know, one thing that strikes me during all of the pandemic is, you know, these, these quarantines, you know, the, these groups of people, that this need for community, and, and how do we tap into that? I mean, that's really what got through you know, I, I know my husband and I can speak from from firsthand experience of, of what got us through it was our core, you know, group of, of, of friends and family that we interacted with on a regular basis, whether it was digitally through Zoom or whether, you know, it was folks that we were um, confident in our in our um, COVID statuses to get together in small groups and really galvanizing those relationships. And I think coming out of that, we, we've got to look at you know, community building and community building utilizing the, the digital spaces there. I mean, that, that's going to be paramount to, as you mentioned, our fan base is is an aging fan base. How do we tap into and utilize the things that worked during the pandemic with this younger generation? What, what are they gravitating towards immediately? And, and right now is so critical as vaccines become more pervasive and there's more and more um, in-person activity what are they gravitating towards right now and how can we adapt that to the sports environment in the collegiate marketplace? Yeah, I don't, I don't need to beat a dead horse, but um, at the end of the day, I think um, just continuing the connections, calling your friends, whether it's within our own industry or um, across all entertainment. I mean, at the end of the day, other than educating our student athletes, we if you're on the external side, you're you're in the business of entertainment. And so um, what's going to get your fan base to keep coming back? And so making sure you're thinking outside your box by um, looking at other entertainment spaces um, so that you can keep folks engaged. Um, but but I, I chuckle a little bit when I hear, you know, what's the next five to 10 years have in store? Heck, I don't know. If I knew, I'd be a billionaire. So um, really just, again, staying engaged and and trying to read as much as you can, trying to make those connections um, so that when something is thrown at you, um, you're not two, three years behind everyone else. Um, so that's, that's just a, a little different perspective on it. I forgot how hard these are to do with multiple people because I just want to interrupt and ask like five questions to each person. But then I also want everybody to have their turn. And so anyway, we'll, we'll see how this goes. Uh, but a couple, a couple things I want to hit on. Garrett, I, I kind of want to go back to what you mentioned about this membership model with corporate partners and figuring out what that looks like. Can you give us a little bit more insight as to that specific thought process and maybe, maybe explain that for some other people in a little bit more depth? Well, it's right now, it's still, we're going through the planning process, but it's still a little bit of a pipe dream. Um, this gentleman who, who played uh, football for Coach Osborne here in Nebraska, he his outlet mall model is, is very unique. He doesn't charge rent. He charges a percentage of sales. He is so um, bullish on his data warehouse, on how he can drive traffic to his malls that it took, a, and he's got all the, the main retailers there from Adidas to Nike um, you know, you name it, and they're they're in his malls, and I think he wants to be able to help out Nebraska. And how do we do that in house? And I think, you know, we we're getting further down the contracting stage of doing this, but you know, it, it's going to be a work in progress. What you know, what it what it does for our, our fan base. I mean, we're fortunate. We live in a state where Nebraska football is the premier brand in the state. We don't compete with professional teams. Um, very few minor league teams. I'm like, we're lucky to have that here. And so to have our ecosystem of our corporate, you know, 200 plus corporate sponsors all work in unison to be able to offer this experience to our fans and for us to be able to collect that data and offer them back to our sponsors is, is hopefully going to move our, our fan base and, and our corporate sponsor, sponsors up to 300 plus. And so um, just using those technologies. Now, the tough part is, and I think everything that that we do now is based on having people's data, having their information. So how do you reassure your fans and how do you become transparent how you're going to be able to use that data? I think um, one of the reasons we brought our multimedia rights in-house is because we know we're going to be able to control that data. We can look our customers, our, our sponsors in the eye and say, we, we're the only ones that have that data. And we're going to use that only within our family here. And so I think those are some of the obstacles that 
people are, you know, privacy was really important to people, but now if they know that they're losing out on some of these benefits, they want to jump in, they're going to want these discounts, they're going to want to be a part of what we're doing. And so uh, I wish I had more uh, concrete answers for you. Um, but this, right is, now, this is not about concrete answers. This yeah. is just about ideas and, and throw it at the wall. We'll see what sticks. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'll throw it over to Drew and Monica on that note. We're, we're kind of bouncing around here. But when you guys think about data and how it's changed over the years, right, We, I think we all used to think about in the college athletics world as if we understand ticket buying history, we've got a, a clear idea of who our fans are. But we know our fans are so much more than that. And I think as we all seek to become a larger part of our fans' lives, how else are, what are some of the other thoughts that you guys are having about how we use data from our fans and how we collect data from our fans? What are some of the thoughts? It doesn't have to be a specific thing that you guys are working on, but just give us thoughts on how you, how you guys are approaching that. Yeah, I think that that's an excellent question. And, and we're fortunate, you know, at the University of Texas, we do have a wealth of, of data. I think a lot of it through history has been disparate data you know, that we're now aggregating within, you know, data lakes, data warehouses to, to really get that clear picture of what is a fan. Because you're right, we, we do, you know, tend to lean in the industry on a ticket purchasing history, right? That's the most direct interaction we have is you bought a ticket, we know who you are. What we don't know or haven't known is who are the other three people that you bring with you into the stadium? Who are those folks? How do we collect that data? And so I, I know you're going to ask about some, some magic wand type stuff uh, uh, throughout the, this process, but... You know, one of the things that, that we're considering that we're upgrading to already, and again, going back to mentioning watching in the pandemic, how people interacted as consumers, you know, things were done so well digitally where you were able to enter your phone number, you enter your, your email address to get your receipts. You know, I don't want to know, there was no more handling of pens, signing receipts, handing it back. It was all handled mobily through your phone. You know, we, we're looking to implement that same strategy um, and, and, and to Garrett's point of, of not just having your sponsors, you know, act, you know, cohesively together as one unit in data collections, it's really having your contractors, your, your concessionaire, your, your merchandise vendors, anybody that's transacting on a game day, how can we work together? And I don't have a great answer for this for, for these different units to all, you know, gel around a, 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 a transactional platform, a point of sale platform that can collect those things that consumers are now used to doing. I would much prefer going to the coffee shop, tapping my phone, hitting, hitting the screen saying, text me the receipt, and I get it in two seconds. But they, they've, they've got my data, and it's already entered into the POS system at multiple restaurants throughout Austin to where I don't have to enter that again. You've already got it. You know, a lot of what I look at is how do we clear um, barriers um, for our fans? How do we make it as easy as possible to transact with us? And so, you know, the ultimate end game in that is collecting that data and then using it as we have been with the ticket data of market segmentation of messaging and how we're, you know, reaching out. What can we learn from it to make sure that we're offering the right product to the right fan um, in our in our ecosystem? But to do that, we're really going to have to focus on all of these ways that consumers are already comfortable providing their data to the purveyor, which in this case is is us. Yeah, on the flip side here at Tennessee, we're about 20 years behind, so. <laughs> <laughs> and But you're coming at it from a different angle, Monica, right? You've got fundraising and it's a, it's a whole different set of data that you guys are, that you have in there. Uh, yeah, but we just haven't done a really modernized approach to collecting it and absorbing it, analyzing it and using it to generate more revenue. So the awesome opportunity here is that we have a blank canvas um, and so we have a lot of room to grow, but um, we realized really quickly that we even want to maybe even create an entire department just for <laughs> data collection and analytics. Um, we did make a bunch of hires pretty quickly, and so we had to pump the brakes a little bit on this uh, department development um, that uh, I wanted to implement. But um, that is that's the hope that we can. Um, start collecting some of this information and using it again to turn around and generate more revenue. So, um, but we we are a little behind, but that's just an opportunity to grow here. For something like that, Monica, obviously, I think I look across the college athletics landscape and we're starting to see a higher here, a higher there that are around data analytics. When I, f I think the first one I ever saw was 
uh, Kyle down at Alabama. And I'm like, I called him. I said, you've got the coolest role that I've seen. You're the first like data analyst that I've seen in college athletics. What are you working on? He's like, it's all player related stuff. It has nothing to do with the business end of things. And this was years ago when he first started. But I think now we're starting to see more hires become data analysts on the business end. Who are you who are you looking at modeling something like that off of? Because I, I know it really doesn't exist in college right now. It's, it's funny because when I was at Ole Miss and I was with Michael Thompson, Michael Thompson was a data guru. And it was it was lost on me because I just wanted to raise money and that's all I cared about. Um, and, and data is lost on me. I don't, I'm not going to be the smartest person in the room as it relates to data. I recognize that it's a value. And so I'm going to hire to my weaknesses. Um, so I, I, I watched Michael Thompson just make it an art form. Um, and so he wasn't his own department. He had other responsibilities, but he loved that piece of the business so much that, like I said, he made it an art form. So um, I will always, Michael Thompson will always be my first phone call. In fact, when we were um, hiring for our head of external, um, Michael Thompson was my first phone call. Um, and, and now that we have Alicia Longworth, we stole her from the University of Florida and she's amazing. I think she came in and said, wow, we are behind here at Tennessee. Um, and when she got to Florida, they were behind. She said, I, I couldn't believe that we had won national championships at Florida before she got there when I was at Florida and that data wasn't collected. Um, and so just lost opportunities, but but they're much more advanced now at Florida. And, and now hopefully she can bring, bring some of those best practices here. But again, as I, I was, we were looking for that position to be filled, I met so many individuals that just would love to be in a dark room <laughs> analyzing data. And so I want to just snag them and say, OK, here is a blank slate. You're the head of the department. Now go build out your department. Um, again, I, I'm just not well versed in it, but I'm not afraid to admit that. And I'll go hire someone who is and let's find a way to generate more revenue as a result. And that's one of the things we're struggling with at Nebraska. We're if you're 20 years behind Monica, we're probably 18 to 19 because we have the data. We just don't have anyone to analyze it. And one of the things we're struggling with is do you want to hire someone to do it yourself or is that something you want to outsource because it's changing so rapidly? And you know, it's great when every you know app or or salesperson calls you with the latest and greatest thing. But if you don't have the staffing to use all those bells and whistles to analyze that data, it doesn't do you any, any good. And so that's, you know, we're struggling right now. You know, our, our senior associate for external, Brandon Myers, is, is amazing. And we're actually, the timing's great. We're getting out of the office all day on Thursday to plan. Um, as the pandemic, we're gonna add a bunch of positions, but we gotta figure out where do we add that? Is it in content, content? is it in data analyzing? I mean. Those are the, the tough decisions we have to make. And, and I think at some point in order to be the best at it, I want people that can adapt at the times. We may have to uh, to be, be able to be more nimble. We may have to outsource the data analyzing because we just have the data. We don't have it compiled in one area and we don't have anyone currently in staff that can analyze it for us. But I think that's I think that's key in that is, you know, I almost look at it as kind of a hybrid model. I, I, I prefer to have staff that have data, strong data analytics, you know, in their in their portfolio of skill sets, but they can also help us identify external groups that really will move the needle. I mean, that to me, that's as important as anything is not just trying to rely on yourself and put your blinders on to somebody who might have best in class, you know, tools that can assist in that, but to be confident in the folks that are on staff that can identify what those are to utilize and augment them. I, I think it's almost a, a bit of a hybrid approach at least that's the way that i i envision it um in, in my mind and the, yeah, fan I, experience, I, I, the fan experience is getting you, you're going to have to be able to make it as customizable as possible i mean gone are the days of just worrying about what the fan experience is when they get in the seating bowl i mean you need to have the fan experience as soon as they get out of their car and how do you make it customizable i mean there was an article i believe in sbj this week that that talked about that are you know some places and some leagues are going to have um, holograms that greet, you know, through facial, when they enter the stadium, won't be with tickets, will be facial recognition. And they'll have some former star player in a hologram that welcomes each person as they enter the stadium. Now, we're a long ways away from that here in Nebraska, but that's where this thing is headed. Garrett, I think we yeah. saw that in Back to the Future. I can't remember which one of the three, <laughs> but we're about uh, 40 years behind that. Yeah. <laughs> 
I, I look at y'all's stadiums, the people that are, I mean, the three of you that are here, and, and some, of that, some of that technology becomes so challenging. And Drew, you and I have had this conversation offline. It's like, how much infrastructure investment can we actually make when we're only hosting seven events a year? Right. Well, if we're, and, and, and that's where the challenge comes in with some of this AI stuff. But go ahead, Drew. Not only when you're hosting seven events, you know, our, our regular is six events. We, we play our, our Red River game against Oklahoma and Dallas every year. So we've really got six home, home games a year. It is 100,000 seats. They're probably the six most important dates of revenue for the athletics department that exist. Um, but not only is it the, the time, and, and I know that there's a lot of ideas right now around the, the Jerry Jones model, the AT&T Stadium, of activate your stadium 365 days a year. Really, you know, you're in control of changing how often you use um, your venue. But the reality is, on a college campus, you know, those six dates, you're probably not going to outperform those. Um, not just the dates, but also the age of the infrastructure. We're completing a south end zone structure that will bowl in Darrell K. Royal Texas Memorial Stadium for the first time in its history, and that will open this fall. While there are other major parts of the stadium that were built in the 1920s, we're talking about a century old in some areas, so talking about technology and retrofitting and, and really upgrading that infrastructure, on a 100,000 seat building that spans a century, that is a tough putt. But it's one that we're gonna have to solve for. 100%. Uh, there's like five directions I wanna go and that's not even looking at the Google Doc of questions that we have here. Um, I wanna come back to you, Monica. Any other staff or skill, maybe not staff members particularly with clear identified roles, but are there other skill sets that as an athletic department, y'all as a leadership team are looking at and saying, we probably need to infuse or this kind of skill into the organization, or we've never thought about hiring someone with this background or this skill set. We probably should have someone like that in our department. Other than data collection, are there any other skill sets that you're thinking about that probably weren't on the radar five years ago? Well, this, I'd say this is new to me. Um, and, and this is new to Tennessee, although not new to Danny White and the folks who came from UCF, but, um, and, and Garrett understands this, taking the MMR piece in house and, um, the sponsorship piece and, and the outbound ticket sales. Um, right now we, we do work with Learfield IMG for our sponsorship, but we're looking to take the outbound ticket sales in house. That's new to me. Um, and so, and so building out that team in the next few months, um, looking at, at what that looks like and, and what success looks like um, is going to be new for me and for Tennessee um, because we've never had that. Um, and then and then also having on staff um, sort of that sponsorship expert. So even even as we work with Learfield IMG to continue that partnership, having someone on staff um, in athletics that that talks that lingo and, and can relate um, much more closely than, again, any of us who just came up through the world of fundraising. So um, that's just a different approach. It's, it's not new per se and not new to athletics, um, but something that I'm learning as I go and, and is a little bit new to Tennessee. The sponsorship piece is so interesting, and I know Drew and, and Garrett, we could all we could do a whole another podcast on this note, um, where I think traditionally in college athletics, it has been really challenging because you've got one group of people here that are trying to meet a number and do what they can to meet that number. And so they're less invested in doing things that are related to trade or other things that might lift the brand, but aren't going to necessarily contribute to hitting that number. Um, and, and so having that person to be able to bridge that gap between those two organizations, I think is, is a really smart idea, Monica. And, and Garrett, I imagine that's part of why you guys brought it in house, uh, at Nebraska. Yeah, I would say that. And then the other part is it, it's, it's inevitable with whatever's going to happen with name, image, and likeness at some point, you know, the student athletes are going to cut into that corporate sponsorship pie at, at some level. Um, you know, and we're just hopeful that we're going to be able to remain nimble and, and, and through this process that'll, that'll help us in the end, you know, we don't know what it looks like, but we're just, you know, from our standpoint, we wanted to make sure that our options were open. And, you know, I, in my opinion, it's a bad time to be signing a 10, 15 year deal when everything is changing so rapidly in this environment. 
Garrett, you just used my favorite word of the pandemic. If, we, if we've learned anything, it's how to be nimble. Yes. Active, nimble, I use those interchangeably, but the last 14 months has, has taught us that um, even, even big battleships can be nimble and adaptive, and that's where we've got to continue to be. I like agile myself, but uh, let, let's let's pop into the crowd here uh, and ask uh, a question or two. Um, let's see. We'll go with Rachel here first. So she said, what changes, if any, are you thinking and or planning for football season from a fan experience perspective to continue to make fans comfortable coming out of COVID? Um, so, again, this is not by you saying it. It doesn't mean that you're committing to it. Things are changing left and right. But what are some of the things that you're thinking about, about how to welcome fans back into your venue? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we're right in the middle. of We're getting towards the tail end of, of renewal process. We delayed everything this year to provide as much, um, to wait as long as we could and gain as much information as we could get on where the pandemic stood, uh, where vaccinations were. Um, we feel confident, at least in the state of Texas, at, at how well the vaccinations are going and, and where things are going to head um, into the fall. But we were very intentional. We, we produce this beautiful um, renewal packet every year, and usually it's a lot of rah-rah and get excited and great moments and look at all these things that we're doing with Longhorn City Limits and Bevo Boulevard and Smoky Midway. And this year we're adding a, a, a food truck park out there you know, to really capitalize on that Austin vibe of food truck culinary delights. Um, but we were intentional. The center spread this year talked all about the things that we quickly implemented in um, in 2020 football season. And Garrett already mentioned, you know, we, we went light speed. We had a good five year phase in plan for mobile uh, ticketing, mobile season tickets. We'd already activated mobile individual game ticket option. We made it mandatory. We're going to stay there. Um, we're we're going to we're going to stay with the mobile ticketing. We we eliminated cash transactions. It will continue to be cashless. Uh, we'll continue to rely on, on our credit union partner to provide um, cash to card exchange kiosks where you put your money in and get a card out in case you don't have access to a debit card or a credit card or you just prefer to not use your own uh, credit or debit card um, at the game. Um, so those are the things that, that we're really emphasizing that here are the changes that took place while you are away. The 25% we were able to allow in. It's a phenomenal time. I, I, I relish that opportunity to have a, a, a sample study during a football season. Never, ever want to do it again. Um, but, but we took advantage of that. And so we have 25% that are already used to cashless, touchless, um, you know, mobile environment. Now expanding that out into, into the entire fan base. But we're very intentional about making sure that you knew that among all of this new head coach, all gas, no breaks. Look at this, you know, great future schedules coming up with Alabama and Ohio State and Michigan and all that. But the center spread was all around. Yeah, it's going to be safe. We're going to continue wiping down surfaces. We, we have invested in a POS system that is as touchless as it can be. We're not accepting cash. We're, we're using mobile ticketing. You know, these are the things that we control that can put you at ease um, that also help our speed of business. Um, so it's going to wind up being a better experience and a safer experience than it's ever been in the past through these technology changes. Garrett, Monica, anything else you guys want to hook on? We can, we can go to the next question. If I mean, not. those no are the worries. basics. The only other thing, I wouldn't call it exactly innovative, but we booked the Garth Brooks show um, on August 14th, two weeks, three weeks before the start of the season. And so we all know that our customers are – our, our people in general are creatures of habit. So we're hopeful by having a show in there that's 100% capacity, we'll start getting people in the habit, you know, whether it's tailgating or, or, or filling the streets and, and, and creating a fan environment that once they see that concert is done safely, we hope in turn that allows them to want to come back into our football game safely. So that was part of the reasoning process of, of adding a show this summer. Anything else, Monica? We can go to the next one if not. All right, let's rock. Um, okay, so uh, let's hit it. What's something in the news in the last month or two that you have seen that you've it's really got you thinking? You might not have had a conversation with anyone else in the department about it yet, but you saw that headline, you read into the article, you maybe watched a YouTube video or two to learn more about it. Uh, something in the news that's got you thinking about its applicability to college athletics and maybe your organization. Anything that comes to mind for you guys? Dogecoin. Dogecoin. Let's go. To the moon, baby. To the moon. I mean, I, I think that, that 
NFT ecosphere is it's fascinating, and I'm still getting educated on it. Um, I think I shared with you, uh, you know, the, the blockchain <laughs> basics. I, I'm still learning from the ground up on what this is. It's it's really sad. My husband is a software engineer, so he's super into this blockchain tech and NFTs and invests and all this cryptocurrencies and all these things. I'm just I'm I'm still here with it. But I but I realize these are things that are going to be necessary for us to to create and leverage in a new way to capitalize on our on our IP. I mean, these are these are areas that we can expand in. But there's still so much more work and education to be done before you know I, I'm I'm even confident saying the word Dogecoin. It, it's funny on that note, uh, Blake, Drew, Blake and I were talking about it afterwards. He told me to invest in a certain coin and I didn't and it's up 40% today and I almost texted him and said, what the <laughs> hell, Blake, I should have gone in on it. And I'm telling you, li listen to the man, he knows what he's doing. I don't know how, uh, but you know, I just blindly follow. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of things in that space and Drew, you and I have talked about it offline about what the bigger technology can do from a community building standpoint, not just from a digital collectible and an authentication perspective. And that's some of the things we're working on here at Engagement and exploring that and seeing how we can help departments navigate and innovate through those things. But Garrett and Monica, what about you guys? Anything else that you've seen in the news in the last couple months that has you scratching your head thinking, how does that apply to college athletics? I'll jump in. I think because the pandemic is still here and, and yes, while people have been getting vaccinated, there's a lot of student athletes that haven't. There's a lot of staff that haven't. And so what does that mean? You know, we're not out of the woods. We're not. Um, we, we did just get an email, um, a campus email yesterday that if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks anymore. But there are certainly students and student athletes and staff that have not been vaccinated. So what does that mean moving forward and and how are you going to monitor it? So um, I, I don't have the answer, <laughs> but um, it, you still we still have to continue to pay attention to it. And again, I think it, it's really, really important. I think it's really important to be empathetic. You know, don't just make assumptions as to um, why someone is choosing not to or or. You know, I've talked to people in the industry that want to start forcing it and enforcing it and and enforcing um, their student athletes or their staff or their coaches um, to be vaccinated or else they're going to make their lives miserable. And and it just I mean, I just kind of gave a, a side eye like, are, where is your empathetic heart? You know, you just I think we need to stop and try and understand where that individual is coming from and and maybe it requires more education or um, just more conversations just that comfort level but just making sure we continue to be empathetic to the people around us yeah and i guess i would say just going back to drew's point the, the whole nft phenomenon is is incredible i had a, I had a co-worker send me an article about an nba top shot about three months ago and i wrote back that's the dumbest thing i ever heard in, in my life <laughs> And then two months later, I find myself buying 10 packs. I'm gonna, you know, I collected cards as a kid, really intrigued by this whole thing. And now hopefully we're gonna be full speed ahead of doing our own. And I'm I'm the biggest proponent of it. So it's crazy how times change something in the news three months ago, and now it's it's you know, it's in your world every single day. But I think, you know, transitioning, I think the whole artificial intelligence tr uh, trend, uh, you know, you're here in some um, stadiums, you know, in Australia, they're doing chat bots inside stadiums, answer questions. I mean, that's headed our way. I'm hopeful it's 10, 15 year, years down the road, not, you know, one year down the road. But it's it's crazy. The technology is here and, and, and we have to adapt. I'm going to on that note, I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to flip to Robert. I'm going to try to pull Robert on screen here, see if this technology lets me do it. I've never done that on this, but we'll see. Um, so on, on that note of the tech tools, we kind of mentioned it earlier and, and maybe we've already talked about it. Feel free to say, yeah, I've already said my piece on this. But what are some of the other tech tools that you're thinking about? Hey, if you could ma wa wave a magic wand. Budget might be no issue. Internal roadblocks may be no issue. What would be the tech tool? maybe you don't even know what it is that exists yet that you would bring into your organization. I mean, for, for me, and I'm, I'm glad that you asked that because this, this is based off of, you know, I, I mentioned two recent trips that we took. We, we went out West and then we went down to, to New Orleans for, for a function down there and just to watch the culture and, and how it all transacted. What fascinated me was going through TSA and going through um, all the airports now, 
the the I was unaware because I haven't been on an airplane in 14 months. I was unaware that you no longer need to give your ticket to the to the TSA checkpoint. They take your ID and that is it. They do not ask for anything else. It, it, that's it's all tied in now to your identification, except for in New Orleans. It was the only place when we were leaving where they did take your ticket, scan it, check it. But all of the other airports that we flew through or flew through flew to, all they needed was your identification. And it, and it gets my mind thinking. The one thing that I've always wanted to be able to do is to streamline your transaction process. I would love to find a way, you know, and we've seen it in the entertainment industry. We've seen it in the theme park industry, one that you're very familiar with, David, that issues, you know, some form of a wristband. We go to ACL Fest and it's, Tap to enter, tap to pay, tap to get into the to the VIP lounge, tap to go backstage. If you have that access, everything is loaded on what t- one touch point. When I when I enter the the TSA checkpoints and I just need my ID, I'm thinking, why can't we do this across the board, where it's on your mobile device only? That is your parking, is your ticket, is your payment method, is your anything you need to do with transact. With Bevo Boulevard, we've got some VIP spaces in there with Diapetti Lounge. We've got, you know, into the bigger realm of community building as well. You know, watching how fans are interacting now, you know, are there ways to build community spaces within the stadiums that feel more like the sports bar experience where, you know, the communities come together that want that? You know, it was interesting in New Orleans, there were some bars absolutely packed, no one cared. Other places, they were still limiting capacity, and there were there were different clientele moving into different spaces based on their comfort level. But how can we create this culture that is community with ease of access? It is all about technology and ease of access. Can we tie all these things together and do it? You know, I'd love to say with an ID, but you know, the reality is with your mobile phone is going to be an easier way to do that. Connectivity is going to be an issue. There's all kinds of hurdles and roadblocks into this. But that's where I want to see us head with 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 tech. I love it. I want to hang out. Here, with you. go ahead, Drew. I want to hang out. Do you go to these VIP lounges, in New Orleans? Man, that sounds great. Right about now. It's good. It's good to it, know the right people. Yeah. It, this is this is really interesting though because I think a lot of this technology already exists and and right even the you mentioned the RFID bands that Disney has. I mean, at this point. We rolled that technology out at Disney almost ten years ago, and so and that was a that was billions of dollars of investment. But now that technology has almost become democratized, and it's a lot cheaper when you're not the first movers investing in it. I think part of the problem too within our industry, though, is that you have traditional players in the market that maybe aren't as swift to pick up that technology, and they create so many roadblocks for some of the the other guys that are creating some of this technology, but you've never heard of them. Uh, because they're the little guys and they don't have, there's so many things that they would have to do to fit into the bigger infrastructure that you guys already have created. Yeah, it, it still surprises me because I was fascinated the first time that, that we went to Disney and had the wristbands that unlocked your, your door to your room, you know, and then to go to other properties. I think several of the, the Marriott properties have the mobile key. I will take a mobile key to my room any day of the week. I will lose my key. I will deactivate my key. I will drop my key. It will be gone in 20 minutes. I'm not losing my phone. But I also think that's the issue we face in college athletics. And I've been in a number of different athletic departments. The, the issue we have is that if you look at, you know, whether it's these festivals that, that fans are going to, or if it's you're looking at professional teams, these are run by business leaders that have made money in technology. They're bottom line driven and they're going to spend some money to make money. I think a lot of the obstacles we face in athletic departments that a lot of times the decisions are made by athletic directors or CFOs that don't want to spend the money to make money because there's a bottom line that we have to hit. And so I think that's, I've been able to overcome some of those obstacles here at Nebraska because I work for, we have great leadership here, but in other places, it's not easy to do. I mean, there's, there's not very many CFOs in my, in my time that I've worked with um, and luckily we have one here, but on the other side, there aren't very many that I've worked with that are uh, that can see the big picture on some of these items. And, you know, we're not led by these technology business leaders. And so I, I, that's why, in my opinion, that's why we're slow to adapt in college athletics always have been. I think we always will be. Interesting. Mon- Monica, I want to turn it over to you. Uh, you've got a new leadership team there at Tennessee that I, I, I look at some of the things that 
even just what Danny alone did at, at UCF uh, with his team down there, infusing all of you guys into the mix, I think I'm really excited about the direction of Tennessee and, and where you're going to go to what Garrett just said. Uh, I think you've got a strong team there that is willing to invest to generate more revenue and ultimately give it back to the student athletes. It wasn't really wasn't really a question there, but my 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 question would be: What new tech tools are you guys looking at uh, as you think about this, other than data warehouses and and some of those? Again, I I hate to um, air dirty laundry, and I'm ex I'll call it an opportunity, but um, Tennessee really has been a little bit behind on some really basic industry best practices. Um, and again, it's why a lot of us wanted to be a part of this. In my opinion, uh, Tennessee could 100% be the best athletic department in the country. And I say that in front of two people who are phenomenal um, athletic brands. Um, so I, I truly believe that Tennessee can, can be the industry leader and should be the industry leader um, in everything we do. Uh, but we just have a lot of catch up to do. So that's ultimately why I wanted to be here. I wanted to be one of the architects to help us get there. Now we had a ton of talent in place. And so we just have uh, an obligation, I think, to infuse some of these best practices, infuse a little modernization, all while uh, preserving the history and the traditions that have always existed here. Um, again, two other brands in Texas and Nebraska that, that struggle with that too. It, it's you always want to preserve the history and tradition all while keeping up with the Joneses and the 18 to 35 year olds who, you know, have have short attention spans and, and you know, squirrel look to the other way and are doing the next thing. So um, we all struggle with that every day. And, and so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's an opportunity um, and I'm glad I'm a part of it. I love it. Well, I'm going to try to bring Robert on screen. Let's see if it could, we can do this. I, I have no idea if this is going to work. This is a live event. We'll see. It's not letting us. We can only have four people on at a time. So next time we do one of these, uh, we'll only have two guests and, and we'll see so we can bring somebody from the audience in. But all right, I'll ask Robert's question for him. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see it there in the chat, but it says, what are the, what are the types of data points, KPIs, reports that you like to share with your entire external staffs on a regular basis to create the revenue generation mindset and, and keep people focused on revenue goals? Any, anything that immediately comes to mind for you guys, some of the those KPIs that you're really focused on now that or in the future that you maybe wouldn't have been five, 10 years ago? I mean, we're, we're pretty basic here. I, we don't, like I said earlier, we, we, we have a lot of data, but we don't know how to analyze it yet. So we're very bottom line driven. You know, as far as the ticket sales staff, number of phone calls made a week, um, you know, I, I think what's interesting our side with bringing multimedia rights in house, we're changing the model how we handle fundraising as well because we had to get university approval to start offering a bonus structure. And so, not only um, were we able to do that for our multimedia rights team, but we're also going to be able to do that for a fundraising team. So, we're going to be very much operating like a pro model and be very bottom line driven. And we're going to have the data marks up on you know screens across all of the development area, the multimedia rights area corporate sponsorship area where people are going to see the number of phone calls they made in a day, number of touch points, uh, gifts closed, and we're going through that transformation now. So I don't have any special data points. We're still, you know, we hope to get there. We're just not there yet. Beautiful. Well, that works as an answer. Drew, Monica, feel free to say same thing. <laughs> same, exact same as Garrett. No, I mean, right now we're, we're fairly open. I think it's important to point out we don't, it's going to be it's going to sound counterintuitive to say but here in the texas athletics department we don't place the emphasis on revenue generation as our main ultimate goal we, we believe if we do all of the right things with our fans by our fans create the environments create the culture um create and and, and continue to elevate the brand make strategic decisions about what we do with our brand where we engage with our brand the revenue is is going to come. That is not at all meant to be that we don't have revenue goals and projections and targets to hit at all. 
it's just not been a every meeting doesn't begin with where are we at revenue you know where where are we at, at this where are you on phone calls right now we are as i mentioned in, in the midst of, of winding up season ticket renewals and so our our, our wonderful data analytics uh, person Craig Tegas um, has set up a dashboard that everybody has access to at every hour of every day to where they can see where we are currently knowing that we're tracking on a number we report out uh, the next business day of every day how many calls have been made how many inbounds how many outbounds what were all the Salesforce notes you know can we see can we then prioritize um, late renewers can we prioritize folks who have indicated they want to renew but they're waiting to have a conversation with their spouse or their or their ticket holder partner um, you know, how do we utilize that? You know, my philosophy has always been to be extremely transparent. When it does come to revenue generation specifically, you know, you, you ask the question about weekly, biweekly, monthly. We do meet biweekly with all of the owners of revenue points. So we bring in our concessionaire, our, our catering uh, group, our multimedia rights holder, our ticket office, our, our foundation group. You know, anybody who is responsible for generating revenue, um, trademark licensing, merchandising, all of those folks into the room. And what I've seen is just by sharing the information of where they are on certain deals or what, what they're seeing with certain, um, certain events, it was really fascinating to me as a side note to see what happened when we, and this goes back again to that community and thinking differently about how we're engaging different segments of our, of our audience, as opposed to, again, you go the revenue model, let's focus on the top donors. Let's focus on the top donors, let's focus on getting those big gifts and all that. When we only had season ticket holders in the baseball stadium to begin the season, and midway through we were able to open it up to single game sales to, to fill in to a higher capacity number, our revenue shot through the roof. Our, our, our baseball players anecdotally said, man, that, that crowd was packed today. It wasn't. I can show you the data that shows you exactly how low that crowd was attended, but we let in people who were passionate about being there and they brought their wallets with them. So again, it's about figuring out how do we engage the holistic fan base, but having these conversations bi-weekly and learning from the folks who are in charge of maybe this silo of money and this silo of money and that silo of money, suddenly these cooperatives begin to form and we're able to help one another out, whether it's a concessionaire helping a, a Yeti partnership by, by creating a custom Yeti, you know, who's one of our great sponsors and located corporate headquarters here in Austin, through a concessions offer. You know, these are the types of conversations that have to be having at a high level. Um, so really sharing that more than, more than having data points or revenue goals shared amongst the group in, in the entire external areas have helped us. Love it. Monica, how about for you guys? Yeah, I, you know, Drew's not wrong. It, once upon a time here at Tennessee, we did have, I think at our peak, 72, 73,000 um, season tickets um, outstanding. And, and now we're in the 50s. And so is it just focusing on that being revenue? No, it's every department trying to figure out how do we pack that stadium? How do we go about getting those people back? Um, and, and so, you know, is the f game even fun to come to? Let's keep the, the, what's happening on the field, the last piece. That should be the last piece. I, I can't control that piece. So why focus so much on it? Obviously, you want to put the right infrastructure in place in your football um, staff. But I can't control what happens on the field. But I can control what type of event we're going to put on, what type of entertainment we're going to provide you. So when we host Bowling Green that first game and we have people walking out of the stadium after a win, I want to hear them say, man, I can't miss next week. I got to see what they're doing next week. We got to come back. That's how you're going to get those 20,000 you know, people back as a season ticket holder, um, not focusing on the bottom line and I got to have this money and I got to generate this revenue. Um, so I, I couldn't agree with you more, although the revenue helps. So <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And I think just to add on to that, since we're talking half baked ideas, one KPI I'd love to see, I've not mastered how we can figure it out, how to do it though. I'd love to have a weekly meeting with senior leaders where we say, Fans in, fans out. How many new fans did we add this week versus how many did we lose? 
in some way capacity. Now you're, you're talking about adding up merchandise numbers into there. You're talking about viewers. I mean, that would be a really complex number to have. But if you had some algorithm that basically tallied up, this is how many fans we gained this week. This is how many fans we lost this week. I think that would be a cool number since we're talking half-baked ideas. Um, all right. A uh, couple more questions here before we bring us home. Let, let's maybe let's hit on one more. We'll ask it from the crowd. It's Charles from our team. So he's going to He's going to roast me if I don't ask it uh, on here. This is this is his chance to ask a question. So he said, each of you has mentioned the aging fan base as a potential problem. Would love to hear any strategies, experiments your department is considering to attract or retain the aging, uh, the 18 through 35 year old demographic as the next generation of lifelong fans. Uh, any experiments you guys are running for the young guys? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's what you've seen over the last couple of years with, with Bevo Boulevard, Smokey's Midway. Longhorn City Limits, a concert series, you know, before each game is is how are we hitting that? I mean, we, we've got everything for everyone to engage at all levels of, of fan base, but a lot of that, you know, with the Smokies Midway, we're engaging even younger than that. We're, we're indoctrinating the, the, the young families with children to continue that pipeline of Texas fan that it becomes a tradition to come to the 40 Acres six weekends a year, spend time with us, enjoy themselves you know I, I i love the point that monica made about you know the experience again going back to the revenue you know, revenue would say hey let's make sure that we jam as many commercials and sponsor announcements as we can to jack up that revenue to me that drives your fan away you don't want to do that you want to create an environment that people do walk away to monica's point saying man i had fun i can't wait to come back ideally for us hey mom and dad are we coming back next week we come to the next game. I want to be there. I got to meet Hook'em. I got to see Bevo walk down the street. Mom and Dad got to see, you know, the, the concert that they wanted to see and, and making sure that we're hitting the different genres and demographics with the, the intentionality of who we're booking as those acts. So really creating, creating a dynamic, exciting atmosphere. And I'll also note, because I, I mentioned the food truck park earlier that we're adding, all of this comes from the DNA and the expectation of a traveler. How do we make this a vacation? You come to a city, you expect certain things. When you come to Austin, you expect street festivals, great live music, you expect food trucks. I mean, food trucks, great, great cold beer and the taco stand, you know, that's got the best tacos. We've got a lobster roll stand. I don't know what that's about, but it does really well. Um, but that's what you expect out of Austin. So how do we make sure that we are continuing your experience if you're coming in from out of town or if you're a visitor, that you're getting the Austin vibe around the football game and we're creating this, this um, symbiotic relationship between Texas football and the city of Austin and that whole experience. So that's, that's what we're doing to try to hit a lot of that younger demographic. Good closing statements from Drew. Garrett, what do you got? Give, give me something other than live events, hopefully. Well, I mean, we, I will say I'll give Drew a plug. We went down a couple of years ago to observe Bevo Boulevard, so we'll, we'll definitely be stealing that idea but um, and, and hopefully implement this year. But I, I, one of the things we're looking at, we're going to dip our toe, in, toe into the gaming area. You know, we want our fans to be able to sit in the stadium, and, you know, we, we can't do sports gambling yet, but, you know, we've been talking to some companies on – hey, let's guess who's going to score the first touchdown of the game. And, you know, how many yards is this, you know, number 23 going to have rushing? And then have some grand prizes at the end of it because I think gaming is a part of every young person's life. So not only are we going to do live events, but we're, we're going to dip our toe into the gaming area. We don't have a lot of the details worked out, um, but that is something that is going to be a priority for us this summer. Love it. Monica, what do you got? Bring us home. Party decks. We need party decks. <laughs> so, you know, similar to what, what Major League Baseball has done, um, you know, Cowboy AT&T Stadium, uh, UCF and, and Danny and that crew did, did some cabanas, field cabanas. And so, you know, being close to the action, just, just again, we're, we're thinking of having a party deck 18 to 35 where you might not even know a game's going on. You're there to sit, be with your friends and, and figure out – who, which craft brew is hosting this week, um, you know, so tying the sponsorship in that way, um, which restaurant of the week is here serving their food. And you're, you're really just there for the party. And, oh, you, you might hear the crowd. So you look real quick to the to the uh, video board. But otherwise, you're there because your friends are there and it's fun and, and you don't want to you have this fear of missing out. So 
uh, trying to focus on on maybe some different premium areas uh, that that Neyland Stadium just again has not seen, but it's an opportunity. So. I love it. Well, let's let's go ahead and wrap up here. Uh, Garrett, Drew, Monica, where can people follow along all the experiments and different things you're dipping your toes into? Uh, where can people follow you? Maybe it's on Twitter or LinkedIn or reach out if they have any questions and want to learn more. I'm on Twitter at Classy GBR. Follow me. Great plug for myself. Um, email gclassy at huskers.com. It's on the website, so easy to get a hold of. Monica, Drew? Drew. Yeah, my email's on the website as well, monical at utk.edu. So happy to answer any and all questions or just connect with you. Are you on Twitter? Not yet. Oh, come on. I've just told my whole team on a Monday meeting, I'm like, everyone needs to be on Twitter. If I'm on Twitter, everybody's on it. Twitter launching. Just wait. It's going to be epic. It's going to be like like when Kobe, RIP, when Kobe went on and everybody freaked out. Um, Yes, it's going to be epic. Just wait. Sounds good. Uh, Drew, what about you? I am a big Twitterer, so at hook'em underscore Drew. And if you really want the inside information on Texas athletics, you've got to follow Chris Del Conte, at underscore Del Conte. I promise you, if nothing else, it's an entertaining follow. And you'll get to see how we engage with our fan base on the, on the grandest and most minuscule um, topics. You can also <laughs> reach me by email at drew.martin at utexas.edu. We'd love to hear from you. Hook'em. I'll second Drew's thing. I think I, it's always funny seeing you and Chris on Twitter where some fan will be like, we're out of mediums in this size. And you guys will jump in and respond and be like, we're on it. Uh, it's, all, it's always a good time. It, it was it was Diet Coke at softball game the other day. We, we apparently had our, our Diet Coke had blown and we needed to scramble the Jets and get Sodexo over there to replace the canister of Diet Coke. And they hand delivered a bottle of Diet Coke to the patron that was very upset that she couldn't get another Diet Coke. Too funny. Well, I'm sure that we'll be hearing all of you uh, in the news here soon for some of these different projects and whatnot that you're going to be working on in the near future. So uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Uh, we're, again, we're going to be doing these once a month uh, on different topics. This one was kind of broad with what does the athletic department of the future look like. Next month, we're probably going to be doing uh, in-person versus digital experiences and how much more of a focus are people going to have on digital experiences? What do digital experiences even mean? How do we create community with fans through digital experiences? I don't know who the hell is going to be on that one yet, uh, but we're figuring that out. If you've got suggestions, hit me on Twitter at david.malay. But Monica, Drew, Garrett, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, And everybody that tuned in live, thank you. If you're listening at home while working out or doing the dishes, we appreciate you too. So we'll see you guys later. Thank you.